All right, hey guys, hello. Hope y'all are doing okay. Uh, today we are going to cover contemporary issues point four. We're also going to cover CI five and six. CI is uh, contemporary issues. We got a huge topic to start with, but we're going to go through it uh, fairly quickly and try to break it down pretty simply. These are very broad topics, and a lot of these things don't have a set in stone definition. For example, the word state. It can refer to like the state of Tennessee. It can refer to state as in a whole country, as in the United States. Uh, it can refer to a government. State is a really broad term, and a lot of these are really broad terms. But we're going to try to be pretty specific and talk about what they did, what the different things mean. Okay. So here are your vocab words: state, nation, state, federal states, electoral districts, and mo multinational organizations. Um, so I, I think the best way to do it is just to jump right in. Remember to pause if you need to and email me if you got any questions. Ready? Ready? Let's do it. All right. So a state, like I said, a state has a very broad definition. Um, I was reading about the word state and what it means, and the internet said there's really no definition of state that is 100% accepted. There's all these different definitions. So like I was saying, it can mean government. It can mean state, like state of Tennessee. It has a ton of different things that it means. But what I want you to know, what I want you to take away from it is this right here. So a state is like, it's a common region. It's an area that has a boundary, that has a common culture inside of it, or a fairly similar culture among the people that live there. So, but here's the deal. The state's purpose is for the people, the people that live within that boundary, for them to work, okay? So creating incentives for you to work and the way they do that, the way they say, hey, we need you to go to work and pay taxes and we will take care, we will provide you protection for one's life, liberty, and personal property. So the state exists because the people allow it to exist, okay? We can overthrow it, but why would we if, we're, if we've got the opportunity to work and if we're being taken care of, our life, liberty, and personal property are being looked after, okay? So like I said, state can be really broad, it can be as broad as the name of a country, or it can be as small as the state, like the state of Tennessee, okay? If you want to know more about state, I would suggest Googling it, uh, doing some research on your own, because it is a huge, huge topic, and the word state can be, it can be broken down many different ways. But for our purposes, it's a region, like a common region with a common culture, a smaller region with a common culture, and the people work in it, and uh, in exchange, the government takes care, they protect life, liberty and personal property, okay? All right, and again, very broad, very big word, okay? But let's get to one that's a little easier. A nation state. A nation state, all it is, it's a country, like a nation, but it's a country where, look, a great majority of the people shares the same culture and is conscious of it. So they're like, hey, most of the people that live here are pretty much the same. There's not a lot of immigrants there, and uh, it's kind of, almost, I don't want to say closed down for people to move into, but it's just a culture that's very homogenous, homogeneous, the same types of people, okay? So some uh, prime examples of this are Iceland, South Korea, and Japan. They're places that have a very strong national culture, and it's easily identifiable, and it's basically just a country with the same kind of people living there, okay? All right, so nation states, there you have it. We'll rock and roll then. Now, federation. You live in a federation, whether you realize it or not. The United States is the oldest existing official federation. All a federation is, is that it has smaller regions, and we call them states. It has states, and there's power divided, a division of power. So you've got a larger government, a federal government, a larger government that shares power with the smaller state governments and they respect each other. That's within the constitutions of the states and of the federal government, okay? There's, they realize, hey, y'all have got the major power, the federal government, the big government, the United States government, and then the states have their, local, their state government and they even have local government. So all it is, a federation, it's just a place that has smaller places and they share power. They divide up the power between them, okay? All right. Moving right along. Electoral districts. This is a district where they break it down and it's responsible for electing uh, government members, so congressional leaders, okay? It's broken down by population. So the state of Tennessee is broken down like this, and you can see Murfreesboro, we are in District 4, along with all these areas down here. 
Um, and so it's broken down, it, what it does is it puts all the groups of people together within those populations and it makes it just about equal across the board, okay? Um, it can be single member elections, it can be multiple member elections, um, but only people who live, you can only vote for your district. Uh, our district is represented by a guy named Scott Desjardins, okay? Um, now, later in this class, we'll talk about, if you look, notice, some of these lines are drawn kind of strange. Like, I'm not really sure why Murfreesboro and Middle Tennessee is put in this same category, but Cannon County and Coffee County, which are close, are put way over in this category, but we're in the same category as all these. And we're gonna talk about, that's called gerrymandering. Fancy new word that you probably haven't heard, but we're gonna talk about it later. And it's done for a specific reason. I'm not gonna reveal it yet, but we'll get there. So electoral district is just a smaller division of a state or a country that divides up uh, the way the votes are cast, okay? It's based on population. Last one in this, uh, in this standard, a multinational organization. All that means, you see multi, that means many, national, nations, country, organization, puts them together, right? Uh, so the purpose of this, this is when countries get together, usually for two things. Usually it's for money, such as NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. So countries in NAFTA are Canada, USA, and Mexico. And the reason why they're put together is just to trade, all right? So economics flows really back and forth. Uh, another one is the United Nations, which you learned about in US history class. United Nations was put together to keep peace, really in the world, but mainly in Europe. Uh, on this map, it has the UK as part of the EU. Uh, they're not in the EU anymore, so disregard that part. So, two reasons why multinational organizations exist. The common ones are economic benefits and to maintain peace, okay? All right, so we went through that really fast, but uh, I hope you got the takeaways that I wanted for you. What does the state provide as incentive for its people to work? Remember, you gotta get something back. You're not just gonna go to work just because you love it. Um, obviously, we like money, but you gotta get something back from the state because you're paying taxes to the state. So what do they provide for you? They provide us with protection of life, meaning if you somebody's trying to kill you, they'll, the police will come and help you out, hopefully. Protection of life, liberty, so nobody's gonna come take you prisoner. The state will not do it. They're, they respect your freedom. And personal property, so your stuff, okay? That's the goal. It doesn't always work out like that, but that's the goal, okay? How is a nation state different from a country? So a country can mean like the United States, and the United States is not a nation state because the United States has lots of different types of people. We have a lot of immigrants. We have all different ethnicities here, which is great. A nation state doesn't have that though. A nation state contains, so we'll just do this. Nation state contains, one specific cultural or ethnic group slash, that says cultural slash ethnic group, and they're aware of. They say, hey, we're, we are Korea, we are Icelandic, we are Japanese, etc. How is power shared in a federation? Remember I told you, you got one big supreme federal government and then smaller governments. Uh, power is divided. we'll just say to make it easy between federal government and state governments. Government and state governments. There we go. All right, remember to pause if you need to. There you have it. I'm gonna move right along, pause it if you need it. Beautiful answers. Let me make sure my handwriting is showing up good. Looks great. Great. Uh, all right, what is the purpose of an electoral district? It is smaller regions. Whoops, better erase that. Smaller regions who vote for representatives. So it's broken down by population, okay? And remember, you have to stick, you have to vote for your region. You can't vote for another region. That wouldn't be fair. All right. And number five, what are the common reasons that multinational organizations form? I told you two. First of all, money, economic benefits.
And to keep peace, to maintain peace. Very good. Very easy. If you watch this video and you check this week's assignment, you will see the video is very much worthwhile this time. Hopefully it's always worthwhile, but especially this time. Good, good, good. Rock and roll. All right. Now, this and other, the standards are very, very broad today. And we could spend, I mean, we could spend a whole semester talking about this right here. Explain how technology and globalization, so globalization means our world is becoming smaller. And the reason why it's becoming smaller is because we're way more connected than ever. You can get on any kind of social media right now and connect with somebody on the other side of the world instantly, just like that, okay? You just have to type a little message to someone in India, China, wherever, on the other side of the world, and they can message you right back, just like that. And if you think a thousand years ago, you would have had to get on a boat and sail there and probably die along the way before you would get there, right? Okay, so globalization just means the world is getting smaller, our technology is getting better, and how those things shape new methods of human interaction. Just like I just told you, the internet keeps us all connected. So, like I was talking about, a thousand years ago, and even before paper got to Europe, remember China made paper first, but before it got to Europe, ideas spread very, very slowly. You got small little cultures that come up with different ideas and different theories on creation, and different all these mythologies, and they're all kind of, you know, right there in that one little culture, right? They're localized. That's the opposite of globalization, it's localized, it's small, okay? And even before the printing press, remember the printing press changed the game because now books can be printed quickly instead of being handwritten. So ideas before then were spreading really, really slowly. Printing press comes along, so we get more books. Books start to be spread around, and then ideas, huh, people are starting to think, okay? Times are changing. Fast forward, so that's what, uh, 1400s, 1500s. Then we get to the telegram in the 1800s. Wow, people can communicate across the country pretty quickly, right? Speeding up the process. People can also start to fly in the early 1900s. That changes things because you can fly somewhere and tell someone something, right? And then finally, and this is just within the last, what, 30-ish years, 25, 30 years, uh, the internet. The internet is a game changer. And of course, the telephone came out before that too. Uh, the internet is a game changer, okay? Because now we're all interconnected. So uh, the takeaway that I want you to get away from this, that I want you to pull from this, is that as technology gets better, and our, it's gonna make our world smaller, globalization, we're all one big global community right now because we're all connected, right? And so things, humans can interact quickly and therefore ideas spread really quickly, okay? So let's answer our question. How has the invention of better modes of travel and technology affected human interaction, okay? Our world has gotten, I'm gonna put it in quotation marks because it didn't actually get smaller. It's the same size, we're just more connected than ever. And that's called globalization. We, like I said, you know, you can get on the internet right now and go to a news website for uh, news in Russia and you'll know exactly what's going on, okay? Uh, and before, you may not even know Russia existed. Uh, so our world has gotten smaller due to globalization and ideas spread, we can say almost instantaneously. Pause it if you need it. And that's it. So as technology and travel get better, our world gets smaller because we're more connected and ideas spread very quickly, okay? One more. All right, so this is another one. We can talk about this all year long, okay? Uh, but we only have one standard on it, so we're gonna go through it pretty quick. Identify how geography, so that's the earth, landforms, climate, environment, shapes culture, economics, politics, and history. So first one we're gonna do is culture. This, I mean, if you've been in, like you, since sixth grade, when you started taking social studies as its own class, this has been a theme. The way, the place where you live, where you live, affects how you live, right? So the landforms that you have, the places where you live, for example, these people, obviously fishing is gonna be a major uh, culture there because uh, the, they have a river here, right? And this is probably also how they make money. So based on where you live, affects how you live. 
So notice what I wrote. Humans live differently in coastal areas than they do in the mountains, right? If you live on the beach, you might do more fishing than someone who lives in the mountains. If you live in the mountains, you probably go hiking more than someone who lives on the beach, right? It's that simple, okay? So where you live affects how you live. There you go. It's very, very simple, okay? Now we can go very, very in depth in that and talk about the different cultures and everything, but for this class, unfortunately, we only have one semester, so we don't have time. All right, geography and economics. Economics is how you make money, all right? And based on where you live, it's gonna determine how you live, okay, and how you make money, right? So notice, these people live on a hillside, and in this region, they get a whole lot of rain. So they figured out they can manipulate their environment, they can uh, adapt and modify their environment, number five things in geography, they can modify their environment to where they get a lot of rain on this hillside and they can grow up. They're probably growing rice here um, uh, or tea, uh, but this is called terrace farming. So terrace farming, they've adapted to their environment and they're making money off of it. This is economics here, making money, okay? All right, and again, it depends on where you live. Where you live depends, determines how you make money. So like I was talking about, if you live near the beach, you might be a fisherman to make money. If you live out in the desert, you may uh, be a salt farmer. I don't know if they're farmers. I don't know if that's what you call it. But they dig up salt out of the ground. You know, deserts like the Sahara Desert, uh, they dig up the salt and they transport it places to areas that don't have access to salt. Okay? And they've been doing that for thousands of years. All right? So geography, where you live, affects how you make money. And then that, when money gets involved, of course, we get politics. So when uh, the government sees its people making money and doing well in the economy, they want to kind of control that, okay? So the big ones, the big resources, and resources are a result of geography, where you live, such as, so like oil, okay? Oil regions, or regions that have oil. The government wants to control those areas because they can monetize them, and if they can monetize them, they can figure out the best ways to make the most money off that, okay? And so geopolitics, geopolitics, you could have your own class on geopolitics, okay? But um, it just means the government's interest in the earth and what it offers. And that, it turns into usually conflict, okay? So like oil in the Middle East, all right? All right, again, huge topic, just trying to break it down as quickly and simply as possible. And of course, all of these things make up history. So geography definitely affects history. Where you live affects how you live, affects how you make money, it affects what your government does. And all of those things put together, Time is history, right? So all those things together plus time equals history. Culture, economy, politics, all affected by geography. You add time into that, you get history, okay? Okay, I know that was a lot, and I know it was very broad, but hey, it's very simple if you think about it. So write a short explanation that describes geography's impact on culture. So where you live, affects how you live. It determines the clothes you wear. If it's hot outside, you're gonna wear lighter clothing. If it's cold outside, you're gonna wear heavier clothing. And you'll develop culture or customs and traditions based on those things and what's available to you, okay? Which brings us to next, economics. Where you live affects how you make money. Politics, um, let's see, government wants to control resources, which is a form of geography. I'm gonna put G-O-V apostrophe T, that means government. Government wants to control resources, and resources are a result of your geography, okay? Control, we'll call it geographic resources. And that can even include just the land, the boundaries, where they live, the region wants to control geographic resources. Okay, hopefully you got all that. And moving right along. And that's it. And all of that put together, that all adds up to history, okay? So you put all three together, culture, economics, and politics, uh, and plus time, so as time, you know, time goes on, people do things, people make money, government gets involved, that all adds up to history, all right? Cool. Uh, like I said, that's a huge topic. All of those three, all those three things are really huge topics. Uh, and we kind of just busted through them real fast. 
But hey, hopefully you got something out of it. And I really hope you watch the video because it will very much help on the assignment, okay? Uh, guys, hope you have a great day. Have a great week. Email me if you need me to, if you need any help on any of this. And uh, yeah, take it easy and have a great one. See ya.